Now, Gamaliel, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 34, was a Pharisee who was also a teacher of the law. And as Luke wrote in this great book of the Bible, he said he was respected by all the people. It was Gamaliel in Acts 5 who spoke on behalf of the apostles that they be treated with kindness and tolerance after being arrested in chapter 4 for ignoring, for ignoring the council's earlier order to cease preaching Jesus as Messiah. And you may remember that it was Peter who said, As for me, I cannot help but speak the things I have seen and heard. They would not stop preaching. They were, the apostles were gathered again in chapter 5. Gamaliel spoke up on their behalf. And in Acts 22 verse 3, Paul testified to a mob of angry Jews that he himself had been educated by Gamaliel. He was well known in the Jewish community as well as the believing community. Now Clement of Rome may be someone of whom you have never heard. Clement served as bishop of the church in Rome in the late first century. The apostle John would still have been alive then. Other of the apostles would still have been alive then. Clement of Rome is considered to be among the first apostolic fathers of the early church. Well, what is an apostolic father? Well, those who were apostolic fathers were sort of the core of Christian theologians who lived in the first and second centuries A.D. who knew personally some of the original apostles and were significantly influenced by them. Clement of Rome penned a letter to the church at Corinth concerning a dispute regarding leadership, as did the Apostle Paul. And his epistle was read not only by the church at Corinth, but among other early churches as well. However, his particular letter was not included in the final listing of books belonging to the New Testament canon. It is possible that any of these men that I have mentioned thus far could be the human author of this book. Now, personally... I believe the most probable author of Hebrews is Apollos. Apollos is mentioned no fewer than ten times in the New Testament. Twice in Acts, seven times in 1 Corinthians, and then once in Paul's letter to Titus. In Acts chapter 18 verse 24, Luke identified Apollos as a Jew, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man who was proficient in the Scriptures. The NASB 95 edition says that he was mighty in the Scriptures, which of course was a reference to the Hebrew Bible. There were no letters written at the time that Acts had been written, as a companion of Paul, he was certainly confirmed by the Apostle Paul. But you remember when the first century uh, apostles referred to the Scripture, they were, until at least the mid-first century, referring to the Old Testament Scriptures. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt a city that had been founded in 330 B.C. by Alexander the Great as a center for Greek culture as well as academia. And not only did Alexandria serve as the capital of Egypt for 1,000 years until the Muslims brought it to its knees about 631 A.D., but there also existed in Alexandria a large number of Jews 
who made that city their home. In fact, it was in Alexandria, Egypt, that Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament into the Greek language. Being completed somewhere in the 3rd century B.C., this translation, known as the Septuagint, or if you ever see the Roman numerals LXX, which stands for what? 70. And yes, it, it, it does stand for the Septuagint, but in the Roman numeral 70, as it is thought that there were 70 Hebrew slash Greek scholars who translated the Old Testament into the Greek language. This translation of the Hebrew Old Testament made the Hebrew Scriptures available both to the Jews who no longer spoke their ancestral language and to the entire Greek-speaking world. The Septuagint, the LXX, later became the Bible of the Greek-speaking early church and was frequently quoted by writers of the New Testament. Now, I want you to get this. There are, in the New Testament, more than 300 Old Testament quotes that appear in the New Testament, and about a third of those were taken directly from the Septuagint. Even Jesus quoted directly from the Septuagint. For example, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus quoted the Septuagint in its rendering of Isaiah 29, 13, rather than the Hebrew scripture which said this, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Now being born and reared in Alexandria, Apollos had to have been exposed to both the Greek and the Hebrew translations of the Old Testament. As such, he not only became well-versed in the Old Testament, as Luke said he was back in Acts chapter 5, but he also developed into quite a marvelous Old Testament professor. While visiting Ephesus, Apollos encountered husband and wife Priscilla and Aquila, who happened to be associates of the Apostle Paul. Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos under their wing, so to speak, and mentored him. This is how Luke recorded it in Acts 18. This man, talking about Apollos, had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the Spirit, he was accurately speaking the teaching or teaching things about Jesus being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began speaking boldly in the synagogue, verse 26 says, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately to him. And when he, Apollos, wanted to go across to Achaia, the brothers, the Christian brothers, encouraged him and wrote to the disciples, i.e. in Achaia, to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now to me, and I'm not always right, I'm usually right, but to me, we have every reason to believe that Apollos wrote this letter. He was a Jew. He was an Old Testament scholar. 
In fact, to understand fully the book of Hebrews requires an in-depth knowledge of the Old Testament, especially its first five books. If you do not understand the Exodus experience of Israel out of Egypt into Canaan, you will fail to understand the book of Hebrews. You cannot understand Hebrews without an intense in-depth knowledge of what happened in the Pentateuch, that is, the first five books of the Bible. Apollos himself found Christ in the Old Testament Scripture. Apollos stood firm as an enthusiastic apologist for Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. Apollos seemed to be a well-traveled, itinerant evangelist. And he was known broadly in the churches of the first century, even by Paul. Now, if that doesn't make the case for Apollos as the most likely author of Hebrews, then a case cannot be made for anyone. Now, having said all of that, perhaps God meant for the identification of the human penman to remain in the realm of anonymity. If that is the case, then why? Here's the answer. So that Christ and Christ alone might be set forth as the highest of the high and the best of the best. The one to whom belongs all glory, all honor, and all obedience. And that makes sense, doesn't it? So, that helps us understand something about authorship for this book. And if anybody ever says, well, who do you think wrote the book of Hebrews? You could say, well, everybody knows Apollos wrote that book. And you can sound very intelligent doing so. Now let's look at the recipients of this letter. As with authorship, precise verification of the original audience has been fraught with debate. However, unlike authorship, the identification of the first readers is critical. Now hear what I'm telling you. Confused and inconsistent interpretations of the book of Hebrews have commonly risen due to the solitary failure to substantiate the recipients. And this is especially true when studying the controversial sections such as chapter 6 verses 1 through 10 and 26 through 31. Passages that appear to place Hebrews in tension with themselves, as well as other New Testament writings, are either alleviated or magnified depending upon one's view of the writer's earliest listeners. Now there are three possibilities as to the identity of the original audience. First, there are those who believe that the book of Hebrews was intended for a Christian congregation whose members stood on the verge of losing their salvation. And in fact, many, many who believe that salvation can be lost Many who do not hold to once saved, always saved, will use various passages from this very book to bolster their ideas of salvation in security. Second, there are those who believe that the book of Hebrews was intended for a mixed congregation of both Christians and non-Christians. The non-Christians, according to this view, were most likely Jews who had not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. As such, these Christians were being encouraged to step up their game 
while the non-Christians were being warned that making a decision for Christ was urgent, in that both the invitation and the opportunity to follow Christ had an expiration date. In other words, decide now for Christ before it's too late. Said another way, a person cannot come to faith in Christ any time he or she feels like coming to Christ. God has to issue the invitation, and He does. But the invitation will not always be on the table. As Hebrews 9 says, today is the day of salvation. Right now. Because you may not have another day left. A couple of weeks ago, I received a text from text message from one of our very dear friends in Rome, Georgia. And she referred to her husband and said, Britt's dad has been in a serious accident and he's on the way now to the hospital. Britt has been a Methodist pastor for a couple of decades. When I talked with Britt later, I discovered that his dad was pulling out of a convenience store at the top of a hill and before he could get positioned into the road, as he was pulling out, a law enforcement vehicle on the way to what they thought was an emergency call, doing more than 100 miles an hour, T-boned his daddy's car. Well, of course, he was non-responsive at the scene. He was non-responsive on the way to the hospital, and he was non-responsive after arriving at the hospital and doing everything they could do to try to bring him around. Do you think that that morning, Britt's dad thought to himself, I'll never see you another day. Do you think an hour before that happened, Britt's daddy thought, no, I've just got 60 rounds of the clock. And it's over. Do you think that Brit's daddy, even one minute, 30 seconds before that terrible, tragic event took place, he had it in his mind, this is it for me. So many people believe that we've got nothing but time. The Bible tells us that we do not. And so the writer of Hebrews, as he wrote this letter and preached this series of sermons to this first century congregation, he was telling them, if you are not saved, to take care of business today. Do not wait. And so just maybe this congregation included both Christians and a large contingency of non-Christians. There is at least one more possibility as to the identity of the recipients of this letter. And it is the one to which I hold fervently, therefore it is the correct one. In my opinion... The first audience who received this letter can best be depicted as an assembly of Jewish Christians who were on the verge of losing not their place in salvation, but their place of service in God's kingdom. Those who take view number one say, you can lose your place in God's kingdom. Those who believe in number two say, you better hurry up and make your decision for God's kingdom. Those who believe in this particular 
identification of the audience. Says, don't mess around with God because you can forfeit your place of service and God will set you aside on a shelf and never use you again and your relationship with Him will become dull, dry, stale. And I would suggest to you today that there are many Christians who are just like that. No energy, no enthusiasm, nothing of the Spirit pulsating through their heart and through their mind, but just drab, sad Christianity. I believe that it is this identification of Hebrews audience that solves beautifully every theological dilemma that seems to be presented in the book of Hebrews. And we are going to see that as we move through Hebrews, we are going to see that again and again and again and again. See, there are all kinds of problems with the book of Hebrews if you do not have a firm grasp on who these people were who first received this letter. And so by the time we finish Hebrews in, I don't know, 2026 20, maybe, <laughs> you will say, Pastor, I agree with you. Now, this congregation of Jewish Christians who were on the verge of losing their place of service in God's kingdom face at least three problems. Here's the first. The people of this congregation were contented with justification, that is, the initial experience of salvation, but they had little or no concern for sanctification that is the ongoing experience of salvation. They entered via the wade pool and they stayed in the wading pool. They never grew. They never matured. They never, they never experienced an uplift on an ongoing basis in the Christian life. These people were satisfied with ceremony and basic elemental instruction, but they had no desire for a deep Christian walk. They had received the present of God in Jesus Christ, but they were missing the purposes of God in holy and consecrated living. Rather than aspiring to be God's agents or God's representatives in the world, their relationship with Him indeed had become bogged down and dusty. God meant for these Jewish Christians to thrive in a spiritual Canaan, and that reference is intentional because this book cannot be understood without knowing about Canaan and Israel's experience there. So God wanted them to thrive in a spiritual Canaan and to shine as bright lights in a dark society. But instead, they were on the verge of languishing in a spiritual wilderness. I will refer to it in chapter 3 as the believer's twilight zone. <laughs> Just as Israel had once forfeited their destiny in Canaan and fell back into the wilderness, so these first century Jewish Christians stood at the same precipice. If you know anything about the Pentateuch, you know that when God pushed Israel back into the wilderness, 
He did not disown them as his children. But essentially he said, you're not working for me anymore. I'll provide your basic needs, but other than that, I'm going to have to wait for an entirely new generation to be raised up before I can lead you to Canaan. See, we think we have time. We don't have time. God has time. We don't. If we're going to serve God, we're going to serve God in the here and now. If we're going to serve God, we are going to be serious about serving God and discovering all of the strength and all of the power and all of the joy and all of the wisdom that comes from connecting to Him on a daily basis. In the book of Hebrews, these anemic believers received no fewer than five warnings. We are going to look in detail at all of them. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you want to jot that down, you can start looking at these passages. Chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 8. Chapter 10, verse 26 through 39. And chapter 12, 1 through 17. They are learning in this book that their spiritual condition is severe. And that continued slackness is going to result in a grave response from God. If you don't understand that, then you do not know the first five books of the Bible. God is not to be viewed as a benevolent old father who is powerless to move against the perennial complacency of his children. God means for his followers to move consistently toward the fulfillment of his plan for their lives. Those who drift in a perpetual state of immaturity can expect God to address that drift and immaturity in an attention-getting way. One 17th century commentator entitled his work on Hebrews like this. Hebrews... The epistle of warning. Now a second problem faced by this congregation of Jewish Christians concerned the hostility not only of the pagan world against the early church, but also the fierce opposition from Jews who viewed Jesus as an enemy of Judaism. Most likely... They had endured the rage of Nero in the mid-60s, or at least they had suffered at the hands of Domitian in the early 80s. In chapter 10, mention is made of a great conflict of sufferings that had come upon them, including public humiliation and the seizure of their property. Allegiance to Christ had exacted a high price for these Jewish Christians. These first century believers lacked encouragement. They lacked confidence. They lacked motivation. They lacked stamina. They lacked urgency. They lacked self-discipline. They lacked a reason to forge the fire no matter how hot or high the flames. The writer of Hebrews sought to provide the mental and emotional fortitude necessary to stay the course. And that is why it is so essential for us to spend time in this letter. Now here's the third problem. The recipients of this epistle, if you can believe it, seem to be considering a return to the practices of Judaism. We're done with Christ. We're through with Jesus. We're, th we're finished with Yeshua. We're going back to the synagogue. We're going back to the temple. 
And perhaps this is because, again, of Jews who have rejected Christ as an enemy. The Jews were causing these Jewish Christians far more trouble than the pagan world. And they said, all this will end if we just go back to the synagogue. Somehow, the, this congregation had failed to grasp the exceedingly unsurpassed splendor of the Savior. Perhaps heated debate and persecution from the Jewish temple and Sanhedrin had led to this temptation. These immature disciples would be hugely encouraged by rehearsing the total sufficiency of the incomparable Christ. The author of Hebrews demonstrated for his readers the superiority of Jesus over the prophets who were huge in Judaism. Over the angels who were huge in Judaism. Over Moses who was the big kahuna in Judaism. The Aaronic priesthood. The covenant. The tabernacle. The sacrifices. As well as Christ's complete victory over the tribulations of life. The supremacy of Christ. Someone asked me just a few days ago. Not Olivia. <laughs> well, what are you teaching on Wednesday night? I said, well, since you ask, I'm teaching or presenting an introduction to the book of Hebrews. Oh, no! This person fired back. I just don't like introductions. I don't know how she thinks she would have ever met me without one, but... So what I want us to do is to say something about the necessity of an introduction as it produces increased understanding as well as a greater opportunity for effective application. So here it is. Number one, a proper introduction to the book of Hebrews offers assurance to the reader that this pericope, that just means one part of a greater whole. I've used the word pericope in the past, and people said, what was that word you said? Well, yeah, that was it. One part of a whole. It offers assurance to the reader that this pericope is addressed, listen to this, to real people in real situations. Doesn't that mean you and me? Yeah. Identifying the original recipients helps us to relate to their story. And knowing their particular situation becomes a passageway for the biblical world to reach across the span of history and land in our own front yards. Second. A proper introduction to the book of Hebrews brings to light the purpose or the purposes of the writer. So what was the purpose of the author who set forth this manual of instruction sent to these first century Jewish believers? Here's how I see it. The writer of Hebrews wanted to take his audience deep into the identity of Christ. He intended to expose his readers to the vast expanse of Christ's distinctiveness, but more than that, Christ's preeminence. Why? Because the more they entered into the person of Christ, then the more they would be able to handle the difficulties and the dilemmas of the present with calm resolve, and the more they would be able to handle the fears of the future with confidence. Now let me show you something. The breadth of one's familiarity with Christ impacts his or her ability to live by faith. Do you know why so many believers are anemic today? 
They just don't know Christ well enough. That was his purpose with them, and it is his purpose with us. You want to handle difficulties and dilemmas and fears and foibles? Welcome to the book of Hebrews, because that's where you're going to find it. Third, a proper introduction to the book of Hebrews peels back a rich layer of redemption's narrative. The author of Hebrews emphasized again and again that the story of redemption is written specifically to us and for us. In Hebrews, we see how God moved in history. First, thousands of years ago, and then 2,000 years ago. And then we see how God still moves in our lives today. Don't forget this. You and I are an integral part of redemption's epic register. You look in the book, we're there. That means God's story, this redemption narrative, is for us. Now look, if that doesn't make you shout, if that doesn't make you want to stand on your tiptoes and yell as loud as you can, then you are probably half dead already. <laughs> Do you have any idea what is going to happen to us as we move through this magnificent book? Fourth, a proper introduction to the book of Hebrews is essential to unraveling some complicated theological issues and restating them in easy to understand forms, making them wonderfully digestible and flavorable. Do you believe that? In Hebrews, the life of the believer is made stronger. In Hebrews, the life of the believer is made sweeter. In Hebrews, the life of the believer is made immovable. Are you listening? We can all be Hall of Famers. We can all reach a plateau where we join the great host of witnesses both to the pagan world and to Christendom. Now, I don't know about you, but I had much rather be in the Hall of Fame than in the Hall of Shame. You know, if I were you, and I'm not, aren't, aren't you glad? <laughs> aren't you glad you're not me? Whew. Listen to this. God is going to move in our lives in a very special way when we hit the ground running one week from the night in Hall of Fame living. You don't want to miss a single Wednesday night. And if you have to, the only acceptable excuse is you're dying or dead already. I mean, I'll just throw that out there. Be sure and pick it up on our website. And may I suggest that you lead your friends to plug in to the teaching that's on our website because this is for them. Let's pray. Lord, what a, uh, what a magnificent way
to begin this study in Hall of Fame living. As we become acquainted with this book, as we become acquainted with the Word of God that is living and active and pierces down to the deepest part of our being, may we respond wholeheartedly and give ourselves without reserve to your calling on our lives. What a terrific, terrific work the writer of Hebrews has done under the inspiration of your spirit to call us back to center. Where we become men and women who live as Hall of Famers. And what we pray and what we ask, we pray and ask in the name of of Jesus Christ, the one who's the soul, the heart of this book. That he might be glorified in us. Amen. Now